Hi there, this is Alvin and welcome to the Kickstart Commerce Podcast where we share search marketing and domain investing strategies to help grow your business. In today's episode, our guest is Zach Muscovich, a Canadian intellectual property lawyer, founder and publisher of Domain Name Law Reports and general counsel at the Internet Commerce Association, also known as the ICA. Today, Zach and I discuss how Zach got his start in internet and domain name law, writing about the future of internet commerce taxation. Zach then talks about his first domain name law experience, including the backstory of Toronto2.com and a few other UDRPs. And of course, we discuss whether or not Zach invests in domain names. Hint, hint, domain names containing the keyword robot. Zach and I then discuss what domain investors should do to protect themselves from UDRP, what to do when they face a UDRP, and the likelihood of domain investors having to fight a UDRP. And last but not least, Zach shares the latest changes with the ICA as well as addressing the top pressing priorities on the horizon for the ICA. So with that, Zach, welcome and thank you for making time to join us today, my man. Well, Alvin, thank you so much for having me. I've been uh, waiting uh, to come on your podcast, and I finally got the invitation. So thrilled to be here. <laughs> it, it, hey, I, I, I tell people, I keep people in suspense waiting at who the next guest is going to be. But it just so happens that uh, it is you today. It well, is you. Great. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, so man, so to kick things off, Zach, why don't you share with the listeners just a bit about yourself at a high level, you know, who you are, your professional, personal background? Sure, we will do, Alvin. Um, cut me off as, as soon as you feel <laughs> it's the right point, but I'll... Time. I'll yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, listen, um, I'm, uh, my name's Zach Muscovich, as you know, I, I'm 49 years old. Uh, I live and work in Toronto, Canada. I am a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for since 1999, so 21 years, and uh, I'm general counsel of the Internet Commerce Association, uh, which is the industry trade group that advances the interests and advocates for domain name investors and related service providers. The Internet Commerce Association is going to be celebrating their 15th anniversary uh, this coming September in Las Vegas. Nice. And yeah, looking forward to that. God willing, everything goes all right with the planning. I've been the general counsel for the ICA for two years and a year before that, the interim general counsel. And I've been practicing domain name law pretty much from the first month that I got my law license in 1999. And over the years, I've handled a lot of domain name disputes, both UDRPs and court cases and have handled a lot of transactions for domain names, buying and selling and joint ventures and leasing and uh, website sales and business sales. And I'm also a, a business lawyer. I do corporate law as well. I'm a trademark lawyer as well. I've been active in the industry for many years and uh, keep meeting new people and, and uh, friends with many of the old timers as well. Now, what's interesting to me about your background, so you said back in 1999, so you got involved like when domains like literally were coming on the scene then. I mean, back then, would you have said that, hey, you know, 20 some odd years later that, you know, that you would have made a living doing doing such things or doing things in relation to domain names? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I've never really thought about it quite like that. I mean, at the time in 99, and, and I was actually involved with internet law before I became a lawyer. So in law school, I became very interested in internet law. And hmm. I, I wrote um, a paper about the taxation of internet commerce in 1995, 1996. It was, pu- it was widely published. It was the first of its kind. And I wrote a paper about, called the 5 billion channel universe, which was kind of forecasting the future of how we wouldn't be limited to, you know, the 13 or 30 channels that were then available on TV. And there was an unlimited number of channels. And so I was extremely excited and optimistic about the internet from those early days, but I never really considered or turned my mind to that. It would be a long-term career for myself because at the time, I mean, Alvin, like 
Literally, if I if I told someone I was an internet lawyer in 1999, many people would ask me what the internet was or what does an internet <laughs> lawyer do. Um, it was really brand new and exciting then, and and I still feel that excitement on some days. <laughs> That's on some days. That's yeah. a, <laughs> that is awesome. Right. That, but it but it is interesting to me because it you know when I think about. Uh, general counsel, you know, trademark law or private practice IP, um, and just being a business lawyer in general, you know, is that something that you knew from, let's say, age six when they said, hey, Zach, hey, buddy, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, what was yeah. that? Did you see yourself doing this or yeah. was it something totally different? Well, my, my parents always told me I was going to be a lawyer. <laughs> Was that during the argument <laughs> yeah, or, or after? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, you know, from a very early age, I, I was very interested in justice and, and fairness. Mm. And so I, I'd set my mind to become a lawyer probably by the time I got to high school. Um, but, you know, once, once I got into, into law school, which, you know, I, I guess that was like 90, 95 or something like that. Uh, I, you know, I wanted to get into something to do with the internet. I was working my way through law school as a waiter in Toronto at a Swiss restaurant, a very trendy restaurant at the time. It was called Movenpick, based in Switzerland. They had a, a several outposts here. And, you know, one, I was the only guy that had an education or was in the process of getting an education there. And so people would come to me with all kinds of questions, Alvin, like, you know, because thinking I knew something, I knew absolutely nothing, even in law school, absolutely <laughs> nothing. Right. But, you know, one, one day this, you know, German pastry chef, you know, he, he stops me on my way out the door after my shift and says, you know, uh, Zach, what do you, uh, what do you think of the internet? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I didn't even know what it was, uh, really. I had generally heard about it. And, and um, that was the first, you know, and then, uh, then after my shift, I was, I was having a coffee at this cafe uh, near my home on my day off. It was called the Jet Fuel Cafe. And I was talking to a guy there and he gave me his business card. And on his business card, and this was like 95, Alvin, it's an internet evangelist on it. And that's when I really got excited. Like, what, what the heck is this internet evangelism? The internet needs an evangelist. And so I, I got very interested, <laughs> you know, in, in the internet then and started reading more about it and started playing around with it, getting, you know, an ISP account, creating a website. And in law school, I felt I wanted to do something, you know, to do with the internet and law, but there was no field. There was no field of internet law. I, I in fact, if you Google, well, there was no Google back then. If you used a search engine called Metacrawler or Alta Vista, uh, and you searched for, you know, internet lawyer or internet law, you would, you would get like a handful of hits perhaps at, at the time. And so I knew I wanted to do something in that area, but there was no, nobody to train you, nobody to hire you, no one to to define what the field was. And so it was really like the wild west. And so I, I kind of decided to make my own way in this field and explore it myself. And that's when I started, you know, researching and writing about, you know, what, what's going to happen with taxation when commerce is done over the internet, something brand new, what's going to happen when you don't need to go to cable or an antenna to get channels from all over the world that anybody can be a broadcaster, these kinds of exciting questions. And so I had applied to a bunch of law firms when I graduated to do intellectual property law, which was kind of the closest field to internet law, even though, you know, with some overlap. And I, I didn't get any jobs from that hiring process because, <laughs> because first of all, they really weren't impressed with my paper taxation of internet <laughs> commerce. And they really didn't know what the heck I was talking about. There's going to be a 5 billion channel universe. And besides that, they said, Zach, you need to have a science background because we do a lot of patents. And, and, and the last science course you took was grade 10 biology. So you, can't, <laughs> <laughs> so you can't be of any assistance to us. 
So I, I ended up getting a job with a, a, uh, an old friend's family law firm doing personal injury. So I started doing personal injury law. This is like broken legs, and car accidents, and slips and falls, dog bites, you know, stuff that, you know, I had like zero interest in. I never grew up saying, you know, I want to help someone with a dog bite, <laughs> you know, right? You know, so, you know, I started doing this kind of stuff. And, and you, you see these horrendous pictures of like the bites and the broken limbs. And you, I'd have to look at these things. I'm like, my God, Elvin, I don't want to be doing this. And so I was always <laughs> looking for something else. And so I passed the bar in like February of 99. And so I was sitting in a, a, a bar not far from the office. And I was reading one of those local newspapers that they used to have all over the place. I don't even know if they still have them around in Austin. I don't think they do in Toronto anymore, but these free newspapers is called now magazine. And there was an article in there about this local artist from the neighborhood I worked in who was involved in a domain name dispute. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, it was, he, uh, uh, two giant companies were suing him in federal court one was Bell, and one was Toronto Star, which was like a major, major media company back then because newspapers were so powerful. And they owned the domain name Toronto.com, my hometown. And he had registered Toronto with the number two at the end of it, .com. And he put us up a site about Toronto. And, of course, they had a site about Toronto. And so mm -hmm. they, they sued him for you know, everything uh, under the sun and damages and injunction, et cetera. And in the article it said he didn't have a lawyer. He was defending himself. So I said, hey, this is perfect. I'm going to contact this guy. I'm going to offer my services. I've got about three weeks of experience as a lawyer. How could he turn <laughs> me down, right? <laughs> yeah. No experience, three yeah. weeks. Yeah, we'll that's, put it on three weeks. That's right. You know, I figure three weeks was three weeks more experience than he had because he was defending <laughs> himself, right? So, so I contacted the, the fellow and, you know, he is more than happy to have a hand. And, and so that was the the first case that a domain name case that I litigated and the first domain name experience really that I had part of the objective of taking the case was to get some experience in the field mm -hmm. and to even maybe get hired by the plaintiff's law firm, the part the, the firm that I was fighting. I was thinking that if I do a good enough job screwing them here, maybe they'll hire me for the next <laughs> one. <laughs> He's like, I got, I got a, maybe a two, maybe a three for one going on this thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that was, that was the first, that was my first foray into domain name law. And then not long after that, um, I got my first UDRP client who's, who's been a client to this day. Like I really? still am in touch with, still in touch with, in fact, I'm still in touch with both of these clients, but the, the sec second one, even till today, um, he was a bit younger than me, you know, maybe he was five years younger than me. I, I must've been 30. So he was probably like 25 or something like that. Um, no, maybe I was even younger. Maybe I was 28 and he was like 23 or something. Uh, he had registered a couple domain names that corresponded to a brand new project. There was, there was this project that had been announced called the Technodome. It was going to be a technological theme park. This is 1999, uh, 2000. And so he read about this in the local newspaper and said, you know, I wonder if they have their domain names. They did it. So he registered technodome.com. Uh -oh. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, but, but, you know, back then there wasn't a real, you know, it was, there wasn't a real sense that there was, he was doing anything wrong because, it, it, you know, the law hadn't developed. People right. really weren't aware of domain names and, and he felt, you know, if they didn't register and I'm the smart guy that registers it, well, then maybe they'll want to buy it from me and that's uh -huh. business, right? You know, it, it, what, cause cyber squatting was a very nascent brand new concept right. back then, right? It's 1999, 2000. So there was, he, he didn't even think he'd done something wrong because he's a very moral guy. He, he thought he was doing something that was fine to do. So they, they brought their UDRP uh, case. It was one of the, you know, the very first UDRP cases there ever was because the UDRP had just been put into place months before. 
So, I mean, if there, I forget the exact number that this case was, but it was something like 35, the 35th case or the 60th case or something like that. It was one of the very first ones. And so I defended him. The first thing I did was I wrote a letter to the complainant's attorney and said, you know, we deny all of your allegations. However, for $5,000, we'll transfer you the domain name. <laughs> right? And, <laughs> and I marked this without prejudice, which means that this is like a confidential settlement communication. Right. Right. So he's, this is not supposed to be used against my client. And the next thing I know, instead of getting a reply to that, uh, it shows up as the new exhibit three or something in the complaint <laughs> that, you know, not only did this thief steal our domain name out from under us, but on top of it, his lawyers tried to extort us for, you know, whatever the amount of money was. I think I probably asked for 25,000 back then. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's small so, sedan. Yeah. So I was I was shocked and aggrieved, Alvin, because you know, I, I had just finished, you know, literally months taking uh, before taking the professional ethics course as part of the bar admissions. And so I was very familiar with these rules that a lawyer is not supposed to, you know, breach this without prejudice communications, etc. So I I I made a formal complaint to the New York State Bar about this guy who'd only been practicing like 60 years or something like that. So I had, I had passed the bar like three weeks and this guy has been practicing 60 years. And, you know, I had such piss and vinegar in me back then that I brought a complaint against him for breach of professional conduct. And how did that work out? <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, then I, then I wrote to him like, how dare you do this? And on top of it, I told him that, by filing that UDRP, he had consented to the jurisdiction of the courts in Toronto for any dispute, mm. uh, right? So this was called a mutual jurisdiction clause, and it's still in the UDRP to this day. When a complainant files a UDRP complaint, they must specify one of two locations for a quote-unquote appeal. It's either the location of the registrant and the who is details, or the location of the of the registrar for the domain name. So in this case, it was Toronto. So I wrote to him and said, listen, no matter what happens with this dang UDRP, we'll be suing you in Toronto. So, you know, put on your winter coat. Because <laughs> 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 you know, you'll be coming up here, right? <laughs> and, right and, that, uh, and that serves you. Yeah, yeah, right. So, so the next thing I know, they must have taken my letter very seriously because they dropped the UDRP like a hot potato because they didn't want to get stuck in the courts in Toronto and sued in Virginia. And <laughs> that was just oh. great because now I've got to explain to my client, Alvin, that, you know, <laughs> you know, that UDRP that I could have typed out at my desk and done the response and then emailed it down you know, to the dispute resident pr provider in Minnesota, and we just all <laughs> remain here. Well, now your domain name is being sued in Virginia, of all places. <laughs> and, and, and so it, it was the first in REM, I-N-R-E-M, in REM proceeding that I'm aware of. It was under this brand new law that they passed in the United States called the Anti-Cyber Swat and Consumer Protection Act. And what it said is that if a trademark owner uh, thinks someone's a cyber squatter and that cyber squatter is in a foreign country like Canada is to the United States, then that trademark owner can sue the domain name itself where the domain name is registered. And so all dot coms run, th uh, run through the route in Virginia. And so they pick Virginia. And I believe even at that time, maybe the Registrar Network Solutions was, was resident there. I forget. But so they brought this in rem action against the domain name in Virginia. And so I, then I had to go explain to my client, you know, what are we going to do about this? We, mm. you know, yeah. out of the frying pan into the fire. And so I, 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 you know, but I thought this was a pretty crazy case because the corporation who was suing, they were Canadian. My client was Canadian. But the court was an American court. 
And that's like, how, how can, how can two foreigners use an American court system like this? And, <laughs> and so I, 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 I got in touch with like the electron frontier foundation, you know, online rights. And I started trying to find some lawyers to take on this case pro bono. And I was selling it to them say, listen, I mean, you, your, your firm is going to want to get in on this whole internet law thing. You know, it's brand new. I'm giving you like a beautiful case, like the first in rem proceeding in Virginia about domain name dispute. And the, the, the complainant plaintiff is like this, you know, billion dollar development corporation that wants to do this theme park. I mean, why wouldn't you want to take this case? So I ended up uh, somehow finding this Washington law firm, which I'll forever be grateful for called Steptoe and Johnson. And they, these aren't just, you know, small time pikers, Alvin. <laughs> these guys were like, you know, general counsel to the national security administration and oh, wow. you know, white house counsel. These were serious dudes. Okay. And so, you know, they agreed to take this case on pro bono, provided that we pay for the expenses, the disbursements. And so I, I said to my client, listen, I'll pay for half of them out of my own pocket. You pay for the other half of them. And, and you know, it's probably going to be that 5,000 bucks because these guys charge like a buck a page for photocopying or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and so we sent them the, the, the money and they said, welcome to Steptoe and Johnson. I'll never forget it. Welcome to Steptoe and Johnson. I mean, and remember, I was the guy who couldn't even get a job at like a law firm other than a personal injury law firm getting a case given a case to step to and Johnson and they were happy to take it on. And so they took it on. They ended up losing the case, but they felt that there was a great appeal. So we found this other lawyer. I think they helped find him like an amazing appellate lawyer, a specialist who was, t- was going to take this case on the appeal. And once again, we just have to pay the disbursements. And so the appeal lawyer, they filed all these briefs, I mean, inches and inches of legal briefs and cases and memoranda. And then it was coming up to the hearing date, finally. And then the complainant, the trademark owner, the guys that we were fighting this against went bankrupt. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So the the plot thickens. Yeah. And so the, the appeals court said, hey, listen, we don't need to rule on this because these guys are out of business. Keep your domain names. So that's how the case ended. We got to keep the domain names. And, but you spent all the money. Spent all the money. But possession is nine tenths of the law. We held on to these domain names. Right? <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so we held on domain names. We were the big winner. Uh, and, you know, the guy, the, the client of mine, friend of mine now, um, he let those domains expire a few years later. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, yeah. Come on. We uh, were fighting tooth and nail, and you just hit that non-auto yeah. renew button. Come yeah. on now. Yeah. Uh, you know, because listen, it's back then, you know, I, I think when I first started out, domains were like $75 for two years. Right. It was a lot of money, right? Um, Might have been around that then, too. Yeah, because it was like a hundred dollars. It was like fifty dollars a year, but uh, the minimum was like two years that you could right. register it. Right. Yeah. So it wasn't cheap, and so people weren't hanging on to domain names, or you know, longer than they had to, or or even back then, um, people would would renew them, and then they would get paper invoices mailed to them. Right. Right. And so, uh, so they they would sometimes. They would get to hold on to domain names until they were canceled for lack of payment of fees, if I recall. And, and then they would send in the paperwork again and then they would constantly do this. Yeah. It was, people would get, you know, their mailman would bring in like 500 envelopes of invoices for network <laughs> solutions. Yeah, yeah. Cause I think, I, I, I think I remember uh, Rick Schwartz sharing yeah. a story. Yeah. I can't recall exactly, but it was something along the lines of he registered a domain and by the time the paperwork arrived on it, he had flipped the domain. Right, right. And was like, well, I'm not paying right. for this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that that's the next owner. That's their that's their situation. And so I know a lot of that uh, that occurred. Now here's the question though. Um, mm-hmm. you getting involved in domain name law yeah. early, you know, for me, the question is the which is uh, the obvious one for me uh hearing this story is okay. 
at that moment, Zach, why mm-hmm. not get involved and actually start registering domains yourself? Did you or did you not? Or had that light bulb, you know, did it just not click? Alvin, Alvin, <laughs> Alvin, one of the dumbest things I ever done or or not did in this case is I never registered domain names for myself. OK, it was like. <laughs> Like, I mean, to this day, I kick myself over that because, you know, back then I was like focused on the law. Like I just finished, you know, seven years of university, three years of law school, year of bar admissions. And it was I was trained and indoctrinated that you're you're taking an oath to serve society, to serve your client. No one said, Zach, you got to serve yourself, too. (laughs) right? And so, you know, it and I so I never thought never even occurred to me that I should be registering names in this business myself. I was so focused on the profession. The only two names that like I registered aside from my law school names, like were the dumbest names you could ever imagine. Uh, Like I I registered like Alvin, I registered robotfishing.com and robothunting.com. I thought it, and I probably registered those in like 99. If you want to know how stupid that is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But, but so, so it's one thing to, you know, you're investing in, let's say these caliber names that, yeah. that, uh, you know, the, the Schwartz, the, the, you know, shillings, all those guys yeah. are investing in. I mean, not even, you know, legal names, nothing in that arena <laughs> in terms of legal. You know, Elvin, like I, I come from a long line of people who've been <laughs> unsuccessful in business. <laughs> like like I, I, I've heard this story growing up, Elvin, like that, you know, my grandparents who grew up on a farm out on the prairies in the West, like, you know, they lived a hard life. You know, they, their, their farm was just full of stones uh, and they were in the middle of nowhere and they're sitting on the front porch one day and there's like a guy kind of saunters across the horizon to, through the fields towards their farm wearing like a prospector's hat. And he walks up to them on the porch and says, you know, you've got oil under them stones. And they thought this guy was friggin' nuts. <laughs> and they sold that terrible farm a few years later, and now it's covered with oil fields. So I, I come by this tradition honestly. <laughs> it's like, yeah, thanks, generations prior. Yeah, all right. Like, man. But but you know, but seriously, there was always always a question like there. I have to give real credit to the the pioneers who who saw the value and put their own money down on those domain names in like 97, 98, 99, because there was a real question about whether there was any future in them or value to them. It was by no means a certainty. When you paid $75 you know, for some domain names, you, you couldn't be sure that you're going to ever see that money back. Also, there was, you know, the 2008, or no, it wasn't 2000. There was a, a dot com, the first dot com crash. That I think was what, 2003? When was that? Dot com, like, cra- dot com bubble. It was like 2001, 2002, right? Well, let's see. I'm just Googling it between 95 and its peak in March 2000. So, yeah. So, so there was a dot com bubble when, at, and at that point, People really questioned whether the internet was just a flash in the pan, a passing fad, uh-huh. and whether it had been overrated and overinvested in, and and value. People lost their shirts on this thing, and so there was also periods of real uncertainty then. But bottom line is, I should have registered some domains for myself. What can I say? <laughs> He's like, next question. <laughs> <laughs> No, so so that's interesting then so you go from i guess you'd say this wild adventure uh of trying to help a guy who was representing himself and mm. and so you i mean you take this i mean that is a wild story to end up where you ended up in you know long story short it's just kind of like hey this guy uh end up basically end up not renewing them so at that point you then decide i guess just coherently to say this is what i want to do for the rest of my days is take these wild and crazy adventures and so i guess now how long was it 
until your next, I guess, gig in terms of uh, yeah. was it more of UDRP or was it more yeah. along the lines of, you know, because I because I know that there are you're representing domain investors, but then at the same time, you're probably also I would imagine companies start coming to you at some point um, with with some sort of domain law uh, situation on their hands. You would have expected that, huh? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? The fact that matters is, is that, you know, I was, I sure I had had this initial experience with these two cases, the Technodome case, the Toronto.com case, but, but there still was no internet law field. Hmm. Uh, there was, there was no one, there was no law firm that had internet law lawyers. And so I was still out in the wild west and trying to, get more experience. So I started, you know, what there used to be a way of seeing when cases were filed. I think there still is for UDRPs. And I would contact these domain owners who'd got hit with UDRP and offer my services often for free pro bono or for a contingency fee. Like if we won, maybe we could sell it or sometimes for, you know, 500 bucks or something like that. And to try to build up experience. And, you know, I would take Almost any case, uh, you know, it didn't matter how bad the defense was. And so some of my early cases, I look at the, the decisions now, I'm like, Zach, you took that defense on? That's crazy. This guy was <laughs> dead to right cyber squad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I, I took it. It's, I got the experience. I mean, I mean, I think I even defended like home depot.biz or something like that. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, so, you know, names <laughs> I would never in touch with a 10 foot pool now. So I, st- I started get you know, taking on those cases and, and, you know, gradually got more and more experience. Um, but the interesting thing about all the domain name attorneys, you know, the names that maybe you know, people are familiar with, like John Berryhill, Ari Goldberg, Jason Schaefer, Stephen Lieberman, Karen Bernstein, me, Zach Muscovich. Uh, what, Gerald all, Levine? Well, Gerald Levine's a different category because he, lit, he he's a scholar. He wrote the book. He comes from a copyright background. But the guys uh. that the guys that started out doing domain name disputes back in the back in the day, they're all lone wolves. They work, you know, for themselves, independent, single person, small law firms, and they didn't. Uh, they were the reason why you know people ask me well, why do you, why did you end up representing respondents and the answer is the same for me probably the same for these other attorneys I mentioned is because the the reason I end up representing respondents is because no no complainant would hire me the reason no complainant would hire me is because the complainants tended to be especially back then the large companies the Coca Cola the Pepsi's the Citibank uh-huh. and they had big law firms that handled their trademarks, right? All their thousands of trademark filings. So it's not like Coca-Cola would go outside of their usual IP trademark law firm to find some small guy to represent them in a UDRP domain name dispute. They would they'd give it to their regular person. And so that's why I ended up representing all response. And that's why these other fellas and gals have too, probably. Interesting. And then so like you're out here kind of lone wolfing it. Now, yeah. when did you, I guess, formally go online yourself? So what happened is I ended up leaving leaving that personal injury uh, firm and going <laughs> out in my <laughs> own after about three and a half years. And and, you know, to open up a, your own law firm takes a few bucks like you need your own computer. Back then, you needed a binding machine because you'd have to bind stuff like regularly, <laughs> you know, Sirlock's binding. Like that was like 600 bucks. Like that was, a, you know, you had to have that. You had to have like a fax machine and a photocopier. You had to rent space. Like there were some startup expenses for a, a lawyer back then. You couldn't just have, a, you know, a laptop and a, and a seat at Starbucks like you need now. <laughs> and uh, And so I had a case that it was a UDRP kind of a case. The domain name was Canadian.biz. And have you heard of Molson Canadian by any no. chance? The beer? Okay, so Molson's is like a huge beer company. Now, I think now they're owned by Coors, uh, but like it's like that kind of stature gotcha. here in Canada. So so they, they brought this UDRP against this 
University of Toronto PhD student named Douglas Black, because he had registered Canadian.biz. And, uh, and he had lost the UDRP. He represented himself the UDRP. But I read about this. I'm like, gosh, you know, everyone should have the right to use the word Canadian. It doesn't just mean a beer, because Molson had a brand of beer called Molson Canadian. That was their brand of beer. It was very, very well-known beer, famous beer, I would even say. But that didn't give them the rights to own Canadian as a mark to the exclusion of all others. So I, I, I called up this guy, Douglas. I said, Douglas, my name's Zach Buswich. I'm a lawyer. I read about your case. I'm very sorry. I'd like to sue these mothers for you. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? He said, sure. But how much will it cost me? I said, listen, this is the best part is it won't cost you a dime, just the disbursement. See, I learned that trick about the disbursements. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> He's yeah. like, I'm going to put that yeah. knowledge to work yeah. this yeah. this next time around. Yeah, yeah. And I say, but listen, whatever money that uh, the court awards us for legal fees, like if the, if the court says, you know, you're, uh, the, the Molson has to p- pay you, co- reimburse you for your legal fees. I said, I get all of that. And I say, if you somehow manage to sell the domain name, then I get, I forget the, the, uh, the percentage of that. And so he said, okay, we're in business. So that was the first case that I had when I opened up my own law office. In, in fact, in order to open up that office, I used the $16,000 that Molson ended up being ordered to pay us by the judge to buy that Sherlock spotting machine, the photocopier. So I was really put motivated. myself in business at this yeah, point. Yeah. So I was really motivated to win this. I said, you know, I got to open up this office. I've got some expenses. So like I was like uh, scorched earth with these guys. I went into court. I filed it. I said, we're going all the way. It appeared in front of the judge. The judge said, you know, I agree with you totally, Mr. Muswitz. How can these guys have a monopoly over the term Canadian? You know, the domain name rightfully belongs to your client. You get to keep it and I'm awarding $16,000 in cost for them to reimburse your legal fees because you should have never have had to have brought this case. So that that's how I started on my own. And I, I eventually put up a website. The guy from the Toronto2.com case who I defended, he was a web developer so he did the website for me nice he, yeah yeah so then during that time like you said still wild wild west i'm yeah. assuming that as you're taking cases though you're likely still writing about just domain name law internet law in and of itself and is that drawing or garnering you visibility and attention that's leading to to additional work or was this hey, you were out there on the pavement grinding, you know, going door to door, trying to find things like you did with this, the gentleman with the uh, Canadian.biz. Well, uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you that, you know, uh, manna fell upon me from heaven. (laughs) 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 But but opportunities did did arise. Like um, one of my oldest clients and friends, Peter Maximich from email.ca, uh, who owns a terrific portfolio of .ca domain names, is a good friend of mine to this day. He found out about me through these other cases because there were a lot of them were in the news. These were in the news, uh, oh. um, right? And so that whenever I'd win a case, I would I'd get in touch with reporters. I'd issue press releases. Uh, you know, Look at I, this I, guy, yeah, his yeah. own marketing machine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, the you know, Muscovy marketing machine next month's rent was coming due alvin i have to do <laughs> something right <laughs> so so you know so he had heard about me and so he gave me a case and it was about cheap tickets he owned cheap tickets.ca a small unheard of advertising or a, a travel agency had come after him uh through the uh, udrp is a cdrp because dotca uh to try to get cheap tickets.ca out of him and we won that and then they sued him in court and we won that and then they appealed it and we won that and by the end it was 10 years we're all 10 years older but we kept winning (laughs) and he kept paying and uh and so so and, and a whole bunch of other cases arose you know from those initial two court cases because by then you know people People start to hear about me either from past cases uh, online or, uh, you know, from search engines or from the news. 
Wow. So that so it's just really serendipitous timing then on your part to have taken the first case, which really didn't result in much. But then you just kept taking cases. And from that, like you said, the Muscovich marketing machine <laughs> was built. <laughs> yeah. the, the original 3M. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. that's right. But, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I did what I, I did what I could because they're really well, I wouldn't say outclassed, but I definitely was outweighed by the big law firms who are getting, you know, the good kind of corporate trademark owner work. So I really had to carve a niche out for myself as representing the underdog that, you know, the kinds of clients that had nowhere else to go. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and where, you know, my fees were, were okay that they, they could afford, but yet, you know, they were right. And they just needed somebody in their corner to help them out with the motivation to win. And so that's what I was able to do for them. Uh, in those early years. Now, Zach, now uh, thinking back to your early years, yeah. juxtaposed to today, yeah. like how have things changed for the ordinary domain investor in what they're likely to experience in terms of domain name law today? Is it much the same or, if, or is it different? And if so, how is it different? So things have, have really come, you know, a long way. Uh, they still have a ways to go, but they've, they've come a long way from, from then, you know, in a couple ways. You know, first, the domain name investing is an actual field now. It's an industry. It has a trade association. It's got trade journals like DN Journal. It's got podcasts such as yourself. It's got blogs such as Domain Investing and you know Domain Name Wire. It, it, there are secondary marketplaces like Cedo and Afternick and Dan.com. We have annual conferences in Austin. I mean, this is an industry and it wasn't always like that. Mm. Um, you know, it, 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 Rick Schwartz had started traffic fairly early on to his credit, but, but that wasn't right there at the beginning in, in 98, 99, et cetera. And so now there's a, there's a, a, a robust and established industry that, where people aren't just operating independently, where they don't know any other people that do what they did. And so they're able to communicate, share tips, have some common practices and best practices. So the business side has matured quite a bit. Then in terms of the, the and, and also the pr prices have gone up and, and domains are identified as assets and are much more, they're much more common to be bought and sold now compared to back then. And in terms of the law, Back then, when, when a, a UDRP or a lawsuit was filed about a domain name dispute, really, it was a total crapshoot. Like, we, there, was, there was no precedent or very little. There, you didn't know how it was going to turn out. All you could say is, let's give it a shot. But, you know, <laughs> I, can't, I can't count on the judge seeing things my way. I can't point to other cases that are similar to this that happened in the past. Uh, and so you, there was really this whole lack of certainty. And even in the UDRP, there was, you know, there's now been 21 years of jurisprudence evolving. So when I see a case, a, a case come in, I'm able to tell with a fair degree of confidence what the outcome will likely be. Back then, there was none of that. It was like, it could go either way. It's a, really a crapshoot. That is interesting because, you know, it obviously is domain name investors. And I know we have listeners that are likely thinking, you know, UDRP is probably the last thing if ever thought about um, mm -hmm. in terms of entering into this industry. And so, like, what is the likelihood that a domain investor is likely to encounter um, a UDRP at any given point, you know, mm -hmm. as they invest in domain names. Yeah. So I, I don't think there's any good data on the likelihood in terms of, you know, what, how many domain names you have to own in your portfolio to be likely to get hit with a UDRP, like one in a thousand or something like that. I, I'm not aware of any good data like that. I think that there's, you know, if I was to draw some kind of general conclusions about who gets these UDRPs. I think that any, not any, I mean, some people are lucky. I know some portfolio owners that have category killer single word coms and, you know, rarely get a UDRP. But if you have any attractive, valuable domain names in a sufficient quantity, 
the odds are that you are going to get cease and desist letters. And the odds are that sooner or later, if you haven't had a UDRP, you're going to get at least one or more UDRPs. So for example, there's one portfolio owner that, that I know that has a tremendous portfolio, completely clean portfolio, Elvin, clean as a whistle. I mean, this guy does not play games on, you know, going to the edge, pushing the envelope, clean as a whistle. He has something like 15 UDRPs against him just because his names are so attractive and people don't want to pay for them. Right? Ah, yeah. Yeah. Ah, so, so it's not even, so again, it's, it's like the old phrase of anybody can sue. It's like, it's not necessarily yeah. about whether or not they're going to win. It's just the fact that they can do it. And so because they can do it, They'll do it. And UDRP is no exception to this rule. Right. It, it kind of reminds me, I think it was a quote by John Dillinger, like the gangster from the 30s or something. They, <laughs> they said, you know, why do you keep robbing banks, John? He said, well, that's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, and then, then there's, you know, uh, other domain investors who their portfolio is of a more recent nature and focuses less on descriptive or generic terms terms and they're more of a brandable nature like you know made up kind of phrases or words and and you know they might pick up these domains on a on a, on a drop or at auction and say you know uh, this is a great sounding name i could imagine it being you know attractive for any number of you know new brands that want to start doing business online etc and somewhere, somewhere in the world, someone has a trademark for that domain name, uh, for that uh, a trademark corresponding to that domain name. And so guys who are dealing in brandable domain names can also face that risk as well. And because, I mean, there's the obvious thing of, you know, blatantly going out, which we don't recommend and registering brands, mm-hmm. kind of like how you said earlier, back in the day of like the, the home depot biz or something, you know, like that. It's like, okay, well, yeah, you, you're likely going to get hit, but if it is in the nature of a brandable or just more of a generic descriptive, you know, term likely is the case. It's not that someone actually has rights to it. It's just, they'll probably try you just to see what happens. Yeah. So like this reminds me, Alvin, is that, you know, earlier on in the days, if if someone was talking pejoratively or negatively about cyber squatters, you know, I took offense because I thought they would they were talking about domain investors. What I mean by that is that cyber squatting was used as a term more often to describe anybody in in our business, right? Mm-hmm. Someone who invests in domain names. These are squatters, cyber squatters. And so when there was something said badly about cyber squatters, I'd be like, you know, I, I would want to fight that and resist that. But but now we've come to the point where there are cyber squatters and we hate them just as much as the trademark owners because right. they they give us a bad reputation. This isn't the business we're in. We don't we don't register typos in infringing domain names. We are domain name investors, which is a completely different breed. And this distinction is really a lot more clear today than it used to be. That's interesting. And I, and I say that because just even talking, um, obviously we got this new thing called clubhouse, which I'm not sure if you're on it, but I think that you are. Yeah, I'm on it. I I started off going, I started going on it much more initially. I haven't been on in a little while. Yeah, same here, same here. And so one of the things that I made note of is kind of that same conversation that was going on in Clubhouse of Mm -hmm. folks that weren't aware of the industry. And so they aren't necessarily uh, as aware of industry terms. So they're they're loosely using things, squatting, squatters, cyber squatters, and it's all interchangeable. Um, When in reality, it's like, no, it's not. Um, they're, they're, They're different things. But at the same time, for those of us that actually know the delineation between um, all the nomenclature, it's having grace to meet someone where they're at, but at the same time, educate them as to, hey, do you realize what actually what you're saying and kind of how you're muddling the the waters here? 
um, in, in terms of both of those of just cyber, well, cyber squatting, squatting, and then domain investing. And so mm-hmm. like in your, I guess, in your best attempt of definition of kind of separating uh, uh, the waters here or, mm-hmm. or, or bringing clear definition, like what is the definition of a domain investor versus a cyber sure. squatter or squatter? Sure. Very similar. I'm a cyber squatter if I register domain name because of your trademark, Alvin. I know about your trademark, or I ought to be know of your trademark because it's well known. And I see you have a trademark, and I'm registering a domain name because I think this domain name will be of value to you because to prevent you from registering the domain name. The only reason I'm registering the domain name is because the, if, of its value as a trademark to you. Okay, that's a cyber squatter. I'm a cyber squatter if I do that. So for, I'm a cyber squatter if I register Coca-Cola.com as a typo of Coca-Cola.com and try to draw the traffic, or I register Coca-Cola.com before Coca-Cola gets a chance to do it, or I register my Coca-Cola uh, and start selling counterfeit T-shirts on it. That I'm a cyber squatter if I do that. I'm a domain name investor if I register a domain name because I see the value in the domain name for no reason that has anything to do with your trademark, Alvin. The value in the domain name is because it's a dictionary word, a generic term, a, a brandable term that I think will be attractive to any number of people. The, I registered this name because of its inherent value, the value I perceive in it that it's got nothing to do with someone's trademark. Got it. Now, let's take that further then and say, okay, someone gets hit with a UDRP, whether they're you know, whether they're cyber squatter, squatter or domain investor, like what should the first step be in terms of their hit with a UDRP? Like what's that process? What yeah. what does it look like? What should it look like? Right. Well, I, I think that, you know, the initial question that that you have to ask yourself if, if you get hit with the UDRP is, is this a, a domain name that I should be defending or did I make a mistake here? Or is it not worth defending? Right, uh, right. Because not at, not every case is, is worth defending. Maybe because the domain name isn't worth a lot to you, and uh, you don't need good. the trouble or the pay the legal fees, right? Or or maybe uh, it found its way into your portfolio somehow, and you were unawares. <laughs> right? Hold on, wait a minute. Yeah. What do you mean? Just found its way into my portfolio. <laughs> Yeah, how, how did things like that just happen? <laughs> you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time, right? <laughs> I mean, it says yeah. if the domain just knock knock, who's oh, there? Man. I'm in your portfolio now. No, yeah. it doesn't happen that right. way. Yeah. Maybe it does. I don't know. Yeah. Or you know, <laughs> sometimes you've done something to domain name the domain name that looks real bad that you, you weren't really aware of like there's some right. real bad ppc going on totally infringing and that makes the whole thing look bad including yep. your initial registration uh right and and there's been now you know what it's funny because I, I say how does that happen but then there mm-hmm. is one thing that that has happened to me once before to where you blindly purchase a portfolio and so you're after let's say it's a portfolio of a hundred, but there are five names out of the hundred that you're after, but you got to buy the whole portfolio. You buy the whole portfolio, it gets pushed to you. And then you figure out there are some names that are in there. Now, in those cases, I have either changed the registration information, contact information, and then hit delete. Right. uh, To get it out of my portfolio. That's a great idea. When that happens to me, I I just change the registrant to your name. (laughs) Well, no wonder I'm uh, I'm showing all of these domain names as my portfolio. I'm like, what the world? I didn't own that domain. Wait a minute. What's happening there? Yeah. Or in some cases, you know, now there has been one moment to where I I did intercept a name that was of, it was actually a geoservice name. And fortunately, I knew the owner of the business and was able to push the name to them. To a certain extent, I, I try to tell people, hey, if you can get in contact with the brand, great. Just try to work something out that, you know, you, you're not going to catch that UDRP. And in some instances, I've heard people say, even go to go as far as to say, it's going to cost, you know, in the neighborhood of anywhere, $1,500, $2,000 on a UDRP 
And a lot of times a business is likely, you know, they may strike a deal to say, hey, we'll pay you a thousand dollars for it. Great if that happens, but if not, it almost works best just giving them that domain name uh, could uh, work best to give them that domain name and try to work maybe uh, goodwill for a future purchase. Yeah, you know, I, I've, I've seen people take that kind of approach down then and then sometimes, you know, it, it, it successful works out in that, you know, you, you reach out to the company and say, you know, I somehow stumbled upon this domain name in my portfolio. <laughs> and uh, I just want to let you know that I think it belongs to you. And, you know, I'd like you to have it. Don't worry. You only have to pay me, you know, what I paid out of pocket or nothing at all, or a right. thousand bucks. And, and, you know, sometimes, you know, the IT department head or the marketing department or the business owner says, okay, that's great. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Other times they're like, Janice, get me a legal on the phone. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Right. We got some guys trying to hustle me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. So I like, hustle. Yeah. I was just trying to be <laughs> humble and help you. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, and and it, I guess it really depends, you know, what kind of day the person's had and whether you know, what kind of person they are, because, True. you know, it, how they look at this kind of solicitation my my general advice would be like if you know if if there's some mistake that was made that you ended up with a domain that yeah you shouldn't have had get rid of it and cancel rather than try to do the right thing and be a good samaritan and offer it to the trademark owner because it just can get yourself in more trouble than it's worth for making that kind of good faith effort Exactly. And so then now for those that do find themselves in, yeah. in just the hot seat there of yeah. PDRP. Yeah. Yeah. So by then, now that we have this thing called the ICA that you mentioned yeah. earlier. Right, right. So now one would think it's probably best to join before. But what happens if you're not, I guess, a member and you join after like a UDRP occurs and just, I guess, kind of lay out the land of what does the ICA offer to domain investors who take part in terms of UDRP or just who take part in general? So, so the ICA, the Internet Conference Association, as I mentioned, it's celebrating its 15th anniversary and, and it has been around a lot longer than I've been a part of it. I've only oh, really just one year. Part, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and no, no. I mean, I only became active in the ICA recently, more or less when I became a volunteer director of it probably about four years ago. Nice. And so, so the, you know, the Internet Commerce Association it advocates for domain investors. And, and a lot of the, the members of the ICA have done well with domaining uh, over the course of their careers. They've, they've raised their children with domaining. They put their kids through college with domaining. They put food on the table with domaining. They've started some incredible businesses with domain names. They've done well from the industry. And they've become ICA members because they feel that you know they've done well from the industry. They want to give back to the industry, but they also do it out of self-interest because domain name investing as a as a bona fide legitimate business isn't guaranteed. You know, with a stroke of a pen, I could eliminate the right to sell domain names for more than their registration fee. They could change the UDRP rules. So if anyone has a trademark, they get your domain name. None of these rules and policies that have permitted domain name investing to flourish over the past 20 plus years are written in stone and can change. And mm. so domain name investors really need to, you know, if, if they want to protect their business, they need to, you know, find ways of ensuring that these rules don't change, that the rules improve. And it's hard to do that as an individual domain name investor because you're running your business. You've got other things to do. Uh, you're not an expert in policy or in advocacy. You're not about to write a paper on Circle ID. You're not about to go to ICANN meetings and join working groups that are reviewing the UDRP or uh, working out rules for domain name transfers, et cetera. And so the way of doing it is, is to contribute in a small way to the ICA. But you know, as a group collectively, the membership fees can be used for to protect the industry. And it's it's a small organization. It it's got seven volunteer board of directors. Really impressive board of directors. You know, stalwarts of the industry. Let me tell you who they are just briefly. Jeremiah Johnson, General Counsel, Cedo.com. Nat Cohen from Telepathy, great portfolio owner, 
expert on UDRP. Daniel Law, parking expert, being in the industry for many years, a real uh, expert and gentleman for innovation RPM. Jay Chapman, Digimedia. This is the company that started with you know watermelons.com, what, uh, one of the great generic word portfolios. Paul Nix, mm. you know, in charge of the you know after Nick at GoDaddy. Tessa Holcomb, Igloo.com, preeminent broker. Adam Wagner from Parking Crew. These are all volunteers who, who work for the ICA uh, without any remuneration because they believe in the industry and they want to protect their livelihoods. And then there's two part-time staff people. There's Camila Sekowitz, who's the executive director, part-time staffer, organizes events, deals with communications, makes the whole operation run on time. And then there's me, part-time. I have my own law practice. Uh, this is a, a part-time effort where I'm the general counsel. And so, you know, I would I would encourage domain name investors when they feel that you know they've reached the point where they could afford from from their successful domain name business the minimum monthly membership dues. I think it's about you know at the very lowest level twenty five dollars a month. Yeah, uh, and that's right? changed, right? I mean, that's yeah. something that was just recently introduced. Yeah, it was it was recently introduced because you know we we wanted to to enable as many people to get involved that were maybe doing this part-time or were uh, newer to the industry or more modest revenues uh, and not create financial obstacles to getting them to support the ICA. So at that very modest level, you know, they're welcome to join as individuals. Of course, we have, you know, platinum, platinum uh, members, uh, uh, such as uh, GoDaddy and Cedo, you know, and others who contribute you know, twenty five thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, this this kind of money, and so those are also who make the whole thing possible. So, you know, for example, just to give you an idea, we have five platinum members: Cedo, GoDaddy, Namebright, Parking Crew, and recently Create dot com. Oxley's company. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 He he just he just contributed. He announced it on Twitter that you know he wanted to give back to the domain name industry because you know the ICA was 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 helpful in assisting GoDaddy to change their policy on, on locking domain names that were subject to a dispute. There's that whole controversy. Right. So so you know we we uh, assisted GoDaddy in, in making that situation better. And you know, and Oxley, uh, to his credit, said, "You know what? I'm writing a check to the ICA because I appreciate the work the ICA does, and, and I want to give back to the industry that's been so good to me." And, and you know, we also have some tr- tremendous gold members. We've got Di- uh, DigiMedia, who I mentioned, that's Jay Chapman, Domain Capital, Andrew Roesner's Media Options. We got PTL. We got Telepathy, Escrow.com, Dan.com. And, you know, all all these people. They they contribute to the ICA because they've done well from domaining and they want to continue to do well from domaining. And they recognize that, you know, without the ICA, there's nobody who's going to advocate for domain name investors because all we do, Elvin, is we pay the money. We pay the money to the registrars. The registrars pay it to the registries. The registrars and registries pay it to ICANN. And we barely have a seat at the table. And we, we got to do we got to do more about that, and and we try to make sure our voice gets heard when it comes to these important decisions about domaining. Gotcha. So it's not that that the ICA represents anyone per se. You know, you're, that's a really good way of putting it. I, I mean, we represent domain investors, but really, it's a member-driven organization. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the members tell us what to do, what's important to them. So Camille and I and the volunteer board of directors, we just try to do what the members want as a collective. Gotcha. So a bit of a bit of collective bargaining then in terms of uh, uh, having safety and, and really having more power in numbers. Exactly. Awesome. Awesome. And so then like what's on the future that you can see the ICA is likely uh, tackling? Yeah. Okay. So a few interesting things on the horizon. Um, one thing is uh, UDRP reform. So we've talked about how UDRP has gone on for you know, 21 years. There's now, um, ICANN runs the UDRP. They're responsible for it. And they are going to be engaging in a review of it, a first review of the UDRP since 1999. Mm. Um, 
And the, the way to participate in that review is you have to have a seat at the table. And the way to get a seat at the table is through participating in ICANN. So the ICA is a member of the business constituency. The I, ICA does a lot of outreach with other stakeholders such as WIPO and the Forum and INTA and trademark owners associations, etc. And so we're going to be sitting at the table going over the UDRP paragraph by paragraph, line by line, to make sure that A, there's no harm done in terms of bad changes to the UDRP that would screw domainers so that, you know, one would be you have a trademark, you file, you get the domain name, period, whether it was a generic term, register in good faith or whatnot, and, and be making, trying to get some improvements to the UDRP that are better for domain investors. That's one thing that's going to be on the agenda. That working group will probably start off, start up sometime the next year. Another thing that we've just got involved in recently, which is, is uh, has to do with transferring of domain names. So, like you probably experienced this yourself. In fact, I'd love to hear what you think about it, Alvin. Is that you know these sixty day locks, right? Domain transfers they get on my nerves. Tell me about that. Tell me about like wh- wh- what's this? What's what's up in terms of your experience with the sixty day locks? Like, what's your understanding of them and why they're there and who puts them on? Well, so it's interesting in terms of of the lock. So as far as I understand it, it would take a situation, let's say that uh, I transfer a domain to person B, um, then the domain is locked uh, and that person could not then try to transfer to person C for at least 60 days, which, hey, that protects against if a domain is stolen. Well, you only know that it's probably going to take one hop. That being said, though, there are ways around it. Uh, Sometimes you can actually call in and kind of demand and say, hey, I need this thing lifted so that I can actually move it. The other side of that is it, it makes me really hesitant when I do a domain transaction to ensure that uh, in my case, that most people have a GoDaddy account. Uh, so that it's, I'm like, listen, I'll I'll transfer the domain to you, or rather, I'll push the domain to you, so that we can handle the transaction in minutes. Versus, if that domain was, if I wanted it in an auction, transferred it to GoDaddy, now it's locked for 60 days. Uh, but I listed on After Nick or Dan, it sells. Well, now I got to wait until 60 days to do the mm-hmm. transaction, which mm-hmm. that is stopping me from making a sell. That's kind of been my experience with it. And that's why I opt for actually pushing from account to account versus actually transferring. Right. But, you know, but, but sometimes like you, if you pick up a domain name at auction and it's at some, you know, random registrar. Right. Uh, and, and so you, you win the auction, you move it to your registrar and then you want to sell it. And you got lucky and some guy like the next week says, I want to buy that domain off of you. And you're like, great. And you're like, but just one thing, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, we got to wait 52 days. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right. So, so, you know, so what we're doing in the ICA is that we've joined this, I can transfer policy working group that's reviewing transfer policies right now like it just started three weeks ago and this a group of uh, experts from you know every kind of stakeholder registrars registries non-commercial users business constituency the ica and we're looking at the the, how transfers work with domain names we want to we want to ensure that first of all people understand what the policies are, because, you know, we tried looking up and reading these ICANN policies and FAQs and websites. They're in, indecipherable, indecipherable. <laughs> and I mean, you know, you just heard me go on and on and on about 21 years of legal experience. I can't understand these things. OK, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so so we need to, we need to make it comprehensible. We need to make sure that even registrars uniformly understand these policies because registrars don't even understand the policies themselves sometimes and say, oh, we have to put on a 60 day lock when there's a change of registrant or when the, we have to put a 60 day lock when it moves from registrar A to registrar B. This is an ICANN policy. No, it is not. I did. Once I got deep into it, Elvin, I see that ICANN does not require 
absolutely these 60-day locks. They leave it up to registrars in their discretion. And they give registrars a way of allowing registrants to opt out of these locks. And, and so registrars need to, to be clear with their customers about what their policies are and allow opt-outs if that's the kind of registrar they want to be. Now, some registrars might say, listen, We'd love for you to be able to move your domain names around like jelly beans all day long, but we have to worry about security as well for your domain name. So, so locks are helpful for your security. And, and that's understandable. Some domainers and domain, domain investors, they feel that security in those locks is, is, is good for them, better than you know these easy tra- portability. And that's fine. We understand some people have different priorities in terms and different balance in terms of security and portability. We just want everyone to to be clear on what is required by ICANN, what is up to the discretion of the registrars, and allow registrants to make informed consumer choices about where they want to take their business, depending on the policies of these registrars. So if the IC wasn't doing that for domain investors, there would be literally nobody from the domain investment community at the table having these conversations and advocating for some clarity here. Right. Or if you did, you'd, I mean, you have some pretty deep pockets doing it. Yeah, that's right. It, you, you'd have to. Like you'd, you'd have to be a Brent Oxley. Yeah, that's right. And listen, Brent Oxley is uh, is in business. Uh, he's got better things to do than go to these things himself, to be honest. Right. right? You know, right. so yeah, so that's where the ICA comes in. Uh, in fact, I have to sit through these meetings. For you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, right. we thank you. We thank you yeah, so yeah. graciously. Yeah. <laughs> you know, th- that that's another front that we're involved in. You know, we, we have also been involved, you know, over time on do- the domain name uh, pricing issue. You know, we uh, a lot of domain investors are concerned about the pricing for .com domain names, for example, and how it's going up. And we've been fighting that fight for 15 years at the IC, long before I came along. We're up against some very powerful players uh, in terms of their own interests in in raising prices. You know, we're hopefully we'll see some traction on that in the future. I see it was instrumental in freezing the dot-com pricing in 2012. That saved the industry millions upon millions of dollars uh, when, when the domain prices were frozen at 785. And they've only recently gone up. So this they're the, going up again yeah, in September, yeah, right? Yeah, they're go, they're going up again, and so these are the and, and these are the kinds of issues that you know are bread and butter issues for domain investors. And you know, if 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 you care about these things, if you're worried about your business's future, then you know I encourage you to give the ICA's website at internetcommerce.org a look, and you're welcome to also contact me personally to find out more about the IC and how you could be involved because you don't just want your, uh, your membership dues. Ideally we'd like them and for you to get involved. There's a lot of volunteer opportunities to help advance the interests of domain name investors. I recently became a member and was pleasantly surprised just by the number of webinars, the number of, uh, you know, educational seminars and everything that you all have going on in addition to everything that you've mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. We we put on the best events, uh, educational events. Like, let me just give you a few examples. We've created annotated, which means like a guided with commentary, annotated domain name purchase agreement template, domain name lease agreement template, domain name broker agreement template. These these agreements have been poured over by lawyers. They're worth thousands of dollars in terms of their creation and their value to you. Those are given out along with seminars for ICA members where we go over these agreements and then distribute them to our members to use. We are going to have uh, an amazing session coming up about United States tax and domain name investing. We're going to have a top-notch accountant come in who's experienced in the industry. We had one of my favorite sessions a couple of months ago. We brought in like the top branding agency in America, one that does all the, like, the branding and domain name searching and clearance for you know Fortune 500 companies, et cetera. And they came in and told us about their business. Last week, I interviewed 
a UDRP panel, so one of the top UDRP panelists in the world, George Nachevansky, uh, and we had a great hour and a half discussion with him. So if the content alone gives you stuff you can't get anywhere else, we go out of our way to find the very best people that you haven't seen before, you haven't heard before, to talk about important, unique issues. And, and so that's one of the added benefits of becoming an ICA member. That's awesome. I didn't really know, uh, I, I or rather I had heard about the ICA, but didn't realize just what it all included and entailed. Um, and so, you know, that, that being said, one of the things that I definitely don't want to gloss past was, you know, just in nature, because I know we have some listeners with different portfolio sizes yeah. and they'll hear something like, oh, hey, dot com pricing is going up and they're kind of like no big deal. Um, yeah. And while granted, obviously, if you're looking at a smaller portfolio, let's say 100 or less, it's likely not a big deal. You probably can cover that cost. But yeah. once you get into the area to the tune of, you know, 1,000, 10,000, 50,000, 80,000, and yes, there are people out there with portfolios, even 100,000 domains and more, like, that 10 cents adds up or or however much of an increase it is, it adds up over the uh, quantity of your, you know, domain portfolio, basically domain portfolio size. So that's definitely something of, you know, it's not just a matter of, oh, it's just a couple of bucks. No, it's yeah. like, for some people, it, it is, they're going to not be able to renew uh, quite as mm-hmm. many names. Yeah. Well, well, look, you know, Alvin, like not all, uh, well, not all that all domainers are in the same uh, position, have the same interest. Some larger domainers will have more of an interest in the dot com pricing issue than smaller domainers, right? True. And, and so, so they don't, but you get to pick what issue you're concer- concerned about most. And we cover, you know, pretty much all of them in the IC. But, you know, w- even if you're the smallest domain name investor, can you imagine? If they change the rules, as some people want to see happen, seriously, that yep. domain names that uh, expire, the registry hangs on to them and then markets them for sale as premium domain names themselves. In other words, they have their own marketplace, right? right? Knocking so, us out of the game completely. Knock you out of the game, right? Uh, what what prevents that from happening? Won't, this is a policy change that could happen at ICANN and the ICA is going to be there to stop it if that's ever attempted. That's irrespective of your portfolio size. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so, you know, other other people are saying, you know, there's been articles published about this, Alvin, that we don't like how people are able to buy a domain name and sell it for more than what they bought it for. Right. Okay? They don't. We don't like that. We, we think that if you buy a domain name for $15, you should have to sell it for $15. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's apply that. <laughs> let's apply that same thing to your car, yeah. to your, uh, to your house. Yeah. And I bet you know. For some people, I'm like, oh, oh, all of a sudden, we're we're singing a different tune then. Right. So then, Zach, well, yeah. man, hey, wrapping up, what yeah. would be your advice? Obviously, most of our listeners are domain investors, domain developers, but just the on the whim that someone has listened to us and journeyed mm-hmm. with us. Yeah. And they say, you know what? I'm I'm actually interested in the area of domain name law. Like, mm-hmm. where would you recommend they start? Well, they can pick up my keys anytime they want, Alvin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but listen, if you know, I, I hope that there's uh, you know uh, younger uh, lawyers out there or people who aren't even lawyers yet who want to get involved in domain name law. And you know, there's there's a, a lot of older talent in the industry in the legal profession, and I, I think it, uh, it's time for them to help out the younger generation. I'm so waiting for them to step forward. I'd love to lend them a hand. They can pick up my keys at the end of the training session. And uh, <laughs> and but you know, as as you heard from our earlier the earlier part of the interview, Alvin, this is this is still an uh, an area where you can make a name for yourself with some hustle and uh, by gaining experience uh, pro bono, not charging for minimal fees. And so there's a great opportunity there. And if they are interested in the broader kind of big picture internet policy issues that in terms of internet governance, you know, I can, uh, ICA is a great place to start uh, by volunteering with the ICA and we could get you directly involved in some great stuff that you'll find interesting and helpful for the industry. 
Awesome. Now, if anybody wants to get in contact with you, how might they do so? Yeah. So uh, Zach at Muscovich.com or Google Zach Muscovich. You'll find my website at DN Attorney or go to Internet Commerce and uh, click contact us. And you're welcome to contact Camila Sekowitz or myself. Answer any questions that you have. It is an open door policy. Please feel free to contact us. We would love to hear from you. And with that, we're out of time. So, Zach, thank you again for joining us today and sharing your domain name law experience. Elvin, thank you so much. I really enjoyed uh, this time. I frankly thought we'd only be able to fill five or ten minutes. And and you have (laughs) been uh, exhibited the utmost of patience by letting me go on. So much appreciated. (laughs) No worries at all. Hey, it's my pleasure. And so thank you listeners for tuning in to Kickstart Commerce, where we share search marketing and domain name strategies to help grow your business. Please subscribe to this podcast via iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or Podbean. Last but not least, please visit kickstartcommerce.com to subscribe to the newsletter sharing tips and tricks about the disciplines of digital strategy. Thanks, and that's all for now. 